the uh, story of the Odyssey of Iliad, with which we are concerned this evening, is obviously too long and involved to permit a detailed analysis of all of the elements. Therefore, we prefer to hope that we can give certain basic keys by which the meaning of this ancient and ingenious fable and may be brought more clearly to our understanding. It was probably compiled or prepared or at least reduced to some type of order by the poet Homer, a person of uncertain date who is believed to have flourished in the ninth century before the Christian era. It is only fair to note uh, that we are without general knowledge of the state of the religions of the Greek area at the time of Homer. This was at least 300 years or more before the beginning of that great age of Greek learning, led by Pythagoras and followed by the great Pythagorean successors, Plato, Socrates, Aristotle, and the Neoplatonists. Thus we have largely our knowledge or opinion of Greek religion from the writings of Homer and one or two other early fragments. There is a popular story that Homer was blind. This apparently was doubted, however, as early as the time of Plato. For already an effort had been made to understand the inner meaning of this account. And the philosophers of the Platonic school and those of the Neoplatonic favored the idea that Plato, that the Homer's blindness was symbolical. But it indicated not his inability to see on the objective level, but that he had voluntarily turned his sight inward to the contemplation of those things normally invisible. And that his blindness, like the later story of the blinding of the Cyclops, should not be accepted as a literal infirmity. That he was above or transcended the normal state of man's sight and sense seems to have been implied in this account. We also know that we deal with idiom and with policies and prevailing opinions of a generation and time too remote for our analysis. So we cannot be dogmatic. We can only speculate upon this subject. There is reason to believe that the great Orphic tradition of Greece had developed and was beginning to take dominance as early as the day of Homer. We know that at that time these rites or ceremonies, now called Orphic, were, were particularly sacred and secret and that the general mass of the people had no knowledge of what went on in these initiation ceremonies. It is conceivable, therefore, that Homer could have been one of the earliest uh, to attempt a revelation of these mysteries through a highly allegorical and symbolical poem. Olympiodorus, in his Scolia on Plato, already points out that the fables of Homer should be considered as having a secret and mystical meaning. Here again we must pause, for we have two possible solutions to this mystery. One is that Homer was in possession of a knowledge not generally accessible to the Greeks of his time, a knowledge, however, which was in itself in not all things perfect, inasmuch as Homer seemed to be without awareness of many of the great later teachings of the Greek philosophers. For example, he was not aware of the rising doctrine of immortality as it came to be a dominant in the classical period of Greek thought. It is also possible that the later Greeks interpreted into the writings of Homer by a fortuitous method of reasoning and interpretation. There 
is, of course, always a twofold solution to this enigma. In the first place, the legends and fables of the Odyssey, the Iliad, may have been in circulation as folklore long before the time of Homer. Folklore, as we realize, is a kind of waking dreaming of the folk or a popular collective consciousness. Psychologically, therefore, nearly all ancient legends arise from the internal experience of the individual. Therefore, whether he knows it or not, whether he is aware of this fact or not, his storytelling, particularly when it is derived from earlier sources, is very likely to be highly psychological. The second possibility is that these poems and writings drew out of their interpreters certain secret knowledge locked within the minds and hearts of the interpreters rather than in the original work. I have observed this on many occasions in more modern studies, namely that the meanings of things become brighter and greater according to the light from within ourselves. Thus poems which were not consciously intended to have a message may release a message from the psychic life of the reader of the poem. In any event, by one direction or another. The great poems of Homer gradually came to be considered part of the esoteric literature of the Greeks. And by degrees, these poems were interpreted and unfolded to come to their final and most complete restatement or elucidation or interpretation in the works of the Neoplatonists. These men, by their own naturally mystic inclinations, found mysticism in all things. And because they were convinced that there was a common denominator to human knowledge, they sought this in all the writings of ancient peoples and were able to give lucid and reasonable interpretations to these old stories. In the uh, study of the works of Homer, we must work largely from fragments, even in the Neoplatonic literature. Occasionally, the subject is drawn in, perhaps most fully and completely, but still in an exceedingly fragmentary state, in the writings of Porphyry. Here we have his Cave of the Nymphs, which is a study in one small symbol derived from the Homeric cycle. Here also we have him calling upon the works of others of his own group and school in building a general survey of the basic meaning of the Homeric stories. We cannot, however, say that he exhausts it or even that he gives us an adequate working text. But we can use from him certain material adding to it other extracts from Plotinus and some material from Amplicus on the Mysteries and a considerable amount from the legitimate disciples of the Platonic school and the original group, including Plato and his nephew Spusippus. All these together give us some general picture. I do not think it practical in the brief time that we have to attempt to isolate the sources of the various fragments of the story. It would burden us with constant cross-references. So out of the general picture, we have tried to draw a broad pattern, the elements of which can be variously sustained in different works. But the general combination, consistent with the known beliefs and opinions of the Platonists and Neoplatonists. Now we have some terms and problems arise which have great interest to us at this time because there's perhaps no group of fables to which a more completely psychological explanation has been offered. Uh, from the writings of these early commentators and interpreters, we are fully aware that they had a broad and deep concept concerning the nature of the human soul, a concept perhaps more adequate than what we have today. But because it is obscured in myth and legend, it remains yet to be revealed or released to the general knowledge of mankind. Sometime this must be done because it is going to give us answers to a number of problems, particularly in the structure of man's mental and emotional life, uh, problems which have not yet been adequately approached. So we will introduce, first of all, the character of Ulysses himself, 
or Odysseus as he is in the Greek. And we will try to understand something about him and his place in the great uh, cycle of legend uh, in which he is the principal heroic figure. We know, of course, that this entire work, much as the other great classical and epical poems, the sagas and adas of the world, is essentially a hero cycle. As Carlyle points out, we are dealing basically with the hero or heroic myth. Yet the word hero to us can be applied to almost anyone, from an outstanding football player to an outstanding uh, modern jazz crooner. Uh, the term hero is very broad today. It covers almost anything by which we are distinguished or extinguished from the rest. <laughs> But in the Greek use of the word, as it was in classical times, a very strict and definite definition is implied. A definition which probably is without general usage at all today. The word hero by the Greeks was bestowed as a term or name for an order of souls, having a distinct and complete identity, separate from other souls. Thus we have in their concept of the orders of nature, there are three particular orders of interest to mankind. These are the human allotment, as it was called, the heroic allotment, and the divine allotment. The human allotment had to do with ordinary and general humanity. The human allotment consisted of individuals who in their various activities were living and dying without a driving or natural or inherent purpose. The hero was a combination of the demigod and the superman. But the hero was regarded as a race or kind completely apart from man, as different from humanity as the angels of theology. He was a different kind of being. He was not merely a man who had accomplished some outstanding example of bravery or courage. He was of an order separate, a different genera. He was a creature so that you could say of him uh, that uh, he was either human or heroic. And you had two distinct types of creature, types of being. Yet in the Greek mythology and symbol symbolical philosophy, well, the race or order of heroes uh, was like unto human beings in most conditions. Heroes could meet and mingle with mortals, and like certain demigods, possessed both divine and human attributes. Thus the hero might appear in society and might live an apparently normal life, but he belonged to a different polity, as the Greeks called it. That the inclination of the pole of his psychic axis was different from that of humanity. That is one of the ways in which they expressed it. But it meant actually that as the temperature, flora, and fauna of a planet determined, is determined by the inclination of its axis, so a different inclination would cause a different planetary environment and a different kind of life would flourish upon it. This is the basic thinking. Now above the heroic order was the divine order. The divine order, again, an allotment, which in this case had no relation directly with humanity in the sense of any common origin or destiny. The divine allotment was a race of beings inhabiting heaven. The human allotment, a race of beings inhabiting the earth. And the heroic allotment, a race of beings inhabiting a middle distance between heaven and earth. Or, as one of the Rosicrucian mystics of the 17th century, referring to the heroes or the adepts, said, they live in the suburbs of heaven. <laughs> in other words, they have their own peculiar sphere. You can almost think of it uh, in the terms of Dante, where we have the lower sphere, the purgatorio, uh, rather the inferno, the middle sphere, the purgatorio, and the higher sphere, the paradiso. Well, in the purgatorio would uh, abide the heroic order between heaven and earth, between a divine and mortal state. And the word purgatorio would give us the clue to it because it means purging. 
and purging represented the cathartic discipline of the Greek rites, of mysteries, and of purification. Now the heroic souls, having been established then as a kind of life apart, what distinguishes them from ordinary human beings as far as motivation and basic energy is concerned? According to the Greek concept, the hero is a person or a, a human being who has at some time, either in the present life or in a preceding life, made the final commitment of his consciousness to the process of growth. In other words, it was the dedicated person who had already seen the star and set his course toward it. This course might be slow and might be one of great difficulty and time, but in the hero, the, the wheels of life have reversed their motion. And whether he has gone far or only a little way, he is returning to his father's house. In other words, he has consciously consecrated himself to growth. He is no longer living merely to the gratification of the whims and passing fancies of external life. He has a motion, a pressure, a dynamic within himself by which he is being moved throughout all of the ensuing cycles of his existence in a direct and positive motion toward the fulfillment of his essential destiny. This then would be the simplest basic definition of the heroic state. Now as we approach the story of uh, Ulysses, we come to another division that has to be immediately recognized also. Namely that the Greeks represented or recognized three kinds or steps or levels in the heroic uh, department of existence. They therefore classified their heroes as pertaining to a Jupiterian, Neptunian, or Plutonian allotment. In other words, there were three kinds of heroes. And we learn from the opening parts of the Odyssey that Ulysses was a hero of the Neptunian allotment. In other words, his great uh, adventure, his struggle, everything practically concerned with him has to do with the sea. He is making a long water journey. And when it seems that he is almost going to be victorious, then Neptune, the god of the sea, turns upon him and attempts to destroy him. Ulysses, then, is said to belong to the Neptunian allotment or polity of the heroic order. This means that Ulysses was a hero of only moderate attainments. For in the actual description or discussion of the heroic state, the, Pl the Plutonian hero is one whose achievements relate only to excel excellence on the material level of life. In other words, uh, the conscientious, the dedicated, uh, the truly uh, well-intentioned statesman or warrior, the great general who is fighting for a cause he believes and for the good of his people, but must necessarily use destructive means, may account for a certain lower level of heroic effort, because he is a hero as far as his own understanding permits. And he is certainly divided from that mass of human beings who will fight and run. He is not going to fail in his purpose. He may give his life for his country. He is giving everything that he has and knows. Therefore, he is entitled, under certain conditions, on certain levels of attainment, to be considered as belonging to the Plutonian order of heroes. This is the lowest of the allotments. Now, the Neptunian hero is the second allotment. And in this allotment, according to Olympodorus, it is to be included those who by their heroism save themselves. Now this is a rather interesting and rather complicated uh, pattern, but it gradually <coughs> evolves. You will remember in the story of Ulysses, he alone finally reaches home. He is unable to save his companions. Therefore, he achieves in, in himself a certain heroic destiny 
But in this destiny, he has the gravest difficulties in accomplishing his own salvation. And he is unable to contribute to the salvation of others. This causes him to be considered of the Neptunian allotment, uh, for other reasons which we will also mention. Now the highest, or the Jupiterian allotment of heroes, the highest order of heroic souls, is composed of those who by their heroism contribute to the preservation, redemption, and illumination of others. This was the highest order of the heroes. And uh, uh, Plato and his commentators describing this, allots, allots such persons as Hercules uh, to the higher order of heroes. Also Pythagoras and many of the great scholars and leaders and sages and teachers because they achieved not only their own enlightenment, but contributed to the general enlightenment of others and caused other souls to enter into the path of heroism. Therefore, the great world teachers and sages and saints and prophets and patriarchs who not only helped themselves, but led their peoples uh, to a higher level of integrities, they would be considered of the greater order of heroes. So these were the three allotments which were recognized at that particular time. These allotments again bring into uh, consideration three levels uh, which are related also to the heroic state. We've already mentioned in Neoplatonism uh, the concatenation or ladder of ascending powers, values, virtues and things of that nature. The Greeks assigned to the three orders of heroes also three orders of powers, of which the lowest order, or the Plutonian heroes, were moved by the power of opinion, those of the Neptunian order by the power of sense, and those of the Jupiterian order by the power of imagination. So we have three powers here peculiar to these uh, orders of heroes. And we learn from this assignment uh, that Ulysses was a hero on the level of the power of sense. Therefore, we begin to see that the entire story of his journey has to do with the problem of sensation and with the development of the sensory perceptions of man and the conflict between the sensory perceptions and the internal psychic instincts. Thus we have, to a degree, given you an orientation on Ulysses, what he actually represents in the fable, is a soul that has already been dedicated to the path of progress, that he belongs on the level of the god Neptune. Therefore, that his problem carries with it the level of sense, and that this level of sense, in turn, implies generation. In other words, Neptune, or the principle of water, is the principle of generation. And Heraclitus declared that souls uh, that uh, wish not to become involved in generation must be, remain dry. Because the moment the soul is involved in humidity, it drinks of the waters of Lethe and falls into illusion. Therefore, the problem on the level of sense involves the problem of illusion or the elements of water, which the ancients recognized as a reflector. And by its constant inconstancy, its internal motions, and its being caused to appear as storms and as various miracles upon the surface, yet the depths of it always mysterious and unchangeable, uh, the Greeks decided that it was a symbol of sensation and a symbol of the emotional sphere of man which could so easily be riled upon its surfaces, and yet the depths of which could not even be explored. So we have this orientation on Ulysses. Now the second point that is probably important to us is to consider the land of Troy. And uh, the land of Troy, which was the home of the Trojans, and no aspersions against any of our local universities is intended. The land of Troy was originally the land of Ilium over which ruled old King Priam and all his glories and his powers. The word Ilium comes from Elas, 
which means slime or mud. It is the primordial ooze, the mysterious substance from which life originated in the beginning, as we find in the Phoenician history of Sanchroniathon. It is therefore the primitive matter, the ilium. And in the uh, story as it is unfolded by Homer, Troy is the symbol of matter. It is the symbol of the material bodies of things, their forms and natures and all that have to do with these matters. In the story as it is told, you would naturally expect the Grecians who invented the fable uh, to be favorable to themselves in the interpretation of its meaning. Therefore, the Grecians, representing their country as a philosophic state, or as a great intellectual world, regarded their expedition against uh, Troy as being the symbol or proper symbolism of an expedition of the mind against matter. They held that it was the conflict between intelligibles or internal knowables represented on the intuitive level and the material or external life of the individual. Thus the struggle was that between mental energy and form, the struggle of life and matter, spirit and matter, the struggle of soul and body, or whatever polarity you wish to uh, consider. Now the subject of this little difficulty that occurred in the times of Homer uh, was Helen, or Helene, Helena, the moon a lunar divinity who is said to have been of the order of Venus. Now Venus and Helen, who was her more or less objectification, is described by the Neoplatonists as the symbol of intelligible beauty. Now we've discussed in our last evening's discussion something of Plotinus on the beautiful. So we should begin to understand the concept of beauty as it was understood by these philosophers. Helen, therefore, does not represent mortal beauty, but the archetype or the pattern of the beautiful. This pattern which is captured by matter and rescued by mind. The two armies which struggle for control in the story of the Trojan War. Therefore, Helen is archetypal order, or archetypal natural manifestation, the geometry of the universe, the inevitable harmony of the essential laws of the universe themselves. These laws are taken away or abducted or are placed in a material situation in which their beauty, their wonders, their sublimity, their integrity and their justice are no longer noticeable, visible or acceptable. Therefore, an expedition led by the mind is sent forth to rescue man's understanding of these principles. And we have, as uh, Plato points out, a very good analogy in the simple fact that through understanding, man discovers the beauty of God. Therefore, understanding or the intelligible power represented by the Greeks must rescue Helen, essential beauty, from captivity to matter, or to materialism, and the concept that all things are to be measured by their external or apparent parts, rather than by their qualities. After the war is over, the various expeditions or powers or faculties return by various courses to their own lands, having accomplished the ends. But you will remember that as the result of the war, the Greeks themselves began to quarrel over Helen. Having rescued beauty, they began to argue and struggle over it, to divide it, to variously interpret it, and in one way or another to destroy the very uh, power which they had originally rescued. Thus we see the mind, by its critical attitude, gradually destroying the very beauty or truth which it seeks to discover. The analogies as they unfold are very apt, and uh, whether Homer so designed it or not is of little difference. 
the fact that it can be rationally deduced from these circumstances cannot be denied. Now we must also bear in mind that, uh, that uh, Ulysses was under the patronage of two powers, one more or less regularly assisting him, and the other appearing or cooperating only in ma matters of great emergency. His natal or essential protecting god was Mercury. And Mercury, as the messenger of the gods and as the symbol of intellect, uh, was constantly assisting him to extricate himself from difficult or even tragic circumstances. But when intercession of a superior nature was necessary in some great emergency that arose, then Minerva appeared as Pallas Athena and as a superior deity representing the positive polarities of intuitional understanding, the highest type of the, of the intellect, far higher than mind. Therefore, Minerva, or inspiration, or the power of divine mind, was an emergency available to him. From the time of the end of the war itself uh, to the return of Ulysses to his own far distant native land, we have a story which is the odyssey of man himself, the great story, the great tragedy of man. And in estimating the various elements of it, we will try to point out a few of the outstanding symbols, because these symbols uh, become increasingly luminous as we proceed. Our hero is therefore one who has achieved to the middle order of heroes. He has achieved to the challenge or power of the sensory universe, and his entire adventure or experience relates to the gradual dominion over sense and the release and directing of the next higher faculty, which is creative imagination, or as the ancients considered it, the beginning of the intuitive or inspirational power. He would not achieve fully to this, but when he reached his native land, where he would find the shrine and symbol of his aged father, he would then be ready to be elevated toward uh, unity with the higher order of heroes, the Jupiterian allotment, which, had to, uh, which was concerned primarily with the highest forms of intuitive inspiration. He was returning uh, to claim a larger destiny, which he had to earn through victory over the limitations of his own nature. Now, the sensory world, as it was understood and known to the Greek philosophers, was a world which resulted in the polarization of the psychic nature in a middle distance between a spiritual and a material state. In other words, in a, in a strangely symbolical meaning, uh, the Greeks recognized that the hero was almost the true human being. But that man, as he knows himself now, cannot truly be human until he is born again through the mystery of the heroic attainment. Thus the hero represents the integrated human person in whom the psychic nature is in equilibrium. To attain this equilibrium, the psychic nature must resolve its own conflict and achieve a moderation within itself. These, um, mo this moderation is achieved through disciplines. And these disciplines are either cathartic disciplines or those disciplines for the complete and positive possession of the internal nature itself. Uh, Ulysses, having achieved the potential power of attaining psychic equilibrium, must then find himself suspended uh, like the lion in Faust, twixt heaven and earth, dominion wielding. Since, according to the ancient fable, is that which draws man downward into an objectivity 
or causes him to be bound by matter. Sense, therefore, is the flowing of energy or of the libido uh, toward objectivity and toward the embracing of the objective world. As Narcissus, seeing his shadow in the pool, sought to embrace it, fell and was drowned. That power by which the psychic nature is caused to ascend or rise toward the gods is the theurgic power of the soul, that power which causes it to verge away from matter and towards divine things. And that to achieve this, the internal faculties of consciousness must be awakened. Between these two extremes, or inclinations toward motion, is the equilibrium of the soul itself in its proper state, or in its most natural and suitable state for man, that is, in a middle distance, in which it may still have certain association with matter but also has a certain association with the divine world. Now here we introduce another group of characters who become very interesting to us out of mythology, and they are called the Sirens. Now, um, poor Ulysses had a great deal of trouble with them before he got through with his strange and wonderful journeys. But according to this theology, the Sirens are also divisible into three orders because each one represents the call of energy to a level. The human being living on a psychic level of integration is tempted by one order of sirens to fall into materiality. And these siren powers, therefore, represent a peculiar gravitational pull toward matter present in the psychic life of the individual. They are the allurements of the senses. They are not separate beings, but they are a psychic energy within man by which the senses are stimulated and are caused to gravitate toward objectivity. The second order of sirens uh, release a similar energy on the psychic plane itself, causing the being to pull toward psychic integration, to uh, be lured toward normalcy by another series of stimulations to faculties and powers of his own nature. The third order is that which lures him toward the divine state. And this, again, is the result of the excitation of certain faculties and powers of his own nature. And the energies by which these excitations on various levels are caused and maintained were called sirens by the Greeks. We can tell, for example, also uh, something that has to do with other uh, principles. Nymphs appear, particularly in the train of Circe. And these nymphs represent elemental factors or forces, particularly related to the bodybuilding activities of psychic energy. Therefore, in the cave of the nymphs, we find them weaving a magnificent brocaded garment in royal purple upon a loom of stone, and using uh, all of their skill in a most curious and remarkable way. They are doing this within a cave which has two entrances, or an entrance and an exit. And this cave is polarized to the north and south rather than to the east and west. And the two entrances are under the constellations of Capricorn and Cancer, signifying birth and death. In this cave, which was Porphyry's cave of the nymphs, According to Porphyry and his own interpretation, based upon other Platonic sources, he says that it is uh, known to these people that these nymphs represented the agencies which weave or spin the intricate structure of the human body upon the loom of bones, the skeleton, and that the purple vestment represents the arterial and fleshy system which is woven by the elemental powers 
to cover and adorn the bones or the basic body principle of man. That this partly takes place within a cave, the womb, and other parts of it take place in that larger cave, the Trophonian den, represented by the material life of man, for as Plato points out, human beings live in a cave and are afraid to look out and see what is outside. Therefore, the material world itself is regarded as a cavern, and of course, as we've already seen from its Plutonian allotment, was the underworld. The underworld being actually the sphere of existence in which we live until we make the heroic decision and begin to escape from the mysterious web of circumstance or the mysterious power of body woven in threads of red and purple upon the loom of stone. All of these things have their uh, special and particular meaning and uh, Ulysses to escape the evils of various enchantments carries a moly branch in his hand, a little plant or leaf anciently used in the initiation rites and signifying by its own meaning and its own substance the power of enlightened faith. For where faith abides, the individual has the strength and inspiration to rescue himself from difficult and tragic circumstances. Now we have two other points that we want to cover, and that is to discuss briefly something that is also in Iamblichus on the Mysteries, but which we could not and did not attempt to cover in the original lecture on that, but we need some of it tonight in connection with Ulysses. And that is that, as the ancient Egyptian priest says, each human being that comes into the world brings with him two powers or two natures which are called the essential and the natural daemon. Now our word demon comes from daemon, but it does not have the same meaning. A daemon is actually a spirit. We remember, of course, the daemon of Socrates, the mysterious being that accompanied him and gave him warnings and saved him on numerous occasions. The Socrates referred to this daemon as his god. And uh, it was only in the uh, common pa practice of the early church which took practically every ancient name that was used in the religions of pagan peoples and changed these names into some demoniacal attribute. It was part of this general effort to discredit the ancient religions that has resulted in many of our present terms involved in medieval demonism, especially the term demon, but there are others. For instance, in the medieval time, the prince of devils was called Beelzebub. Uh, the word is simply Baal Zedub, which means in Babylonian, my lord who sings, and was a name of the god Baal, and uh, is uh, closely associated with the two figures of the Egyptian desert, which we call the singing Memnon. They have to do with uh, the, the voice, the sweet voice of the god Baal in the ancient Babylonian mythology. Pandemonium, of course, which is another word we did ill to, simply man means the dominions of the god Pan. And Pan was not by any means an evil spirit, but a nature god, a shepherd, and one who had to, to, to do with the normal and natural uh, problems of husbandry and wife, uh, of husbandry, of life in general, of marriage, fertility, and things of that nature. Thus Pan became the prototype of our modern devil, but had no such meaning in ancient times. In the same way, Lucifer, Lux Pharaoh, the light bearer, was part of the original story of Prometheus. All of these stories and fables have changed with our beliefs, and demon is one of the words that has gotten into trouble. But in the original meaning, it simply meant an attending spirit. It was not some evil being like the Mephistopheles of Faust. The natal demon, according to the Egyptians and the Neoplatonists, was much like what the church later called the guardian angel. And we know by a study of church theology that uh, the doctrine of the guardian angel is not canonical, but uh, it has certain precedents and certain privileges because it is said to be of the mind of the church. In other words, it is acceptable, but not a compulsory doctrine. But the guardian angel, or the idea of a protecting spirit that comes into the world with us, uh, was, of course, heavily known and believed by ancient peoples. 
The essential daemon, as distinguished from the natal daemon, represented a higher power, a power that remained aloof and separate uh, from the particular life of the individual, but continued with him throughout all lives and into eternity. The essential demon and the natal demon, therefore, uh, were described by Plotinus and the other Neoplatonists as those parts of the soul. The natal demon, that part of the soul which extends into incarnation or embodiment, and the essential demon, the oversoul of Emerson or the Anthropos, the part which does not become involved in body. And, of course, in the, in the interpretation of Ulysses, it is stated that in the advanced stages of the heroic state, the essential daemon and the natal daemon are reunited and become one, and are no longer separate, because those parts of the soul which extend into body regain their awareness of their own essential origin and are once more conscious of the essential daemon or oversoul. Now in the uh, story of Ulysses, we come upon an interesting example of the study of the natal daemon on the heroic level. Now the soul flowing into corporeal existence, staggering according to the description given in the, in, by Apuleius in his fable of Cupid and Psyche, loses its natural and beautiful motion and becomes, as it were, intoxicated. <coughs> It has taken upon itself the waters of Lethe, and soul has entered into body as into a prison. And the body, as Plato says, has become the sepulchre of the soul. Or as the same philosopher describes another place, the soul is locked within the body as the oyster is locked within its shell. It is therefore uh, the belief, or was the belief, that the soul, verging toward body, mingling its essences with objectivity, becomes in this manner intoxicated, or loses awareness of its own essential nature, and it becomes soul in body. Now, soul in body, intoxicated and derived, uh, deprived of its essential essence, or essential substance not only becomes the slave of body, but becomes to a certain degree, in a mysterious way, the tormentor of bodies. The soul, seeking a restoration of its own superiority, becomes a tyrant over body. And from those parts of the soul which are embodied, emerge the sensory perceptions in the Greek system. For well, the sensory perceptions are all maintained, sustained, and supported by the psychic energy within the individual. These sensory perceptions, therefore, convey objectivity to the psychic embodied center. And this psychic embodied center, deprived of its own life, deprived of its own realization of its source or root, blinded and distorted by matter, sets up an isolated kingdom of desire so that the embodied soul becomes the servant of desire and from desire and the testimony of the sense perceptions arises the chemistry of selfishness, anger, hate, fear, lust, greed, passion, and finally death. Thus the psychic part embodied within form uh, becomes in the life of the individual an eternal source of temptation. And yet because the energy of the soul is tremendously more powerful than that of the body, it racks the body, it tears the body, it is uncontrollable by the body, and it apparently is forever seeking the discomforting and destruction of the body, not primarily because it wishes to destroy but because it wishes to be free. And the only way that it can be free is by in some way destroying the house in which it lives. Now we can take this thinking and carry it into the field of abnormal psychology and do a number of interesting things with it. It has a great deal of, uh, of importance for us. So what do we have? We have this tyrannical soul 
centered through its tremendous power of the sensory perception. And we have this attempting to bar the progress of Ulysses on his journey home. So, the embodied soul, or the so-called natal daemon, becomes the cyclop, or the one-eyed giant. The one-eyed giant, because the soul's function through the body is by means of the uh, endocrine uh, gangliated system, particularly the third eye in the brain, by means of which the psychic energy both receives and distributes uh, the testimony of the sensory perceptions. Thus the one-eyed giant is symbolized by the cyclop and sometimes represented in the ancient uh, drawings as inverted. is so placed that the, the head or the eye of the cyclop corresponds with the location of the third eye in the body and the body of the cyclop inverted so that his feet are upward. In other words, representing a being existing in another world or of another nature or kind, walking on air instead of earth, but joined to man by the mysterious power of this psychic center or eye. Now man, living in the world of sense, in order to escape from the power of the cyclop, drives the stake into its eye. In other words, it blinds or removes the power of the sensory perceptions to control the psychic energy. This is a, presumably the same thought that was used in reference to Homer himself. That this blinding of the cyclop represented the individual breaking the tie by means of which his internal life is left to the machinations of the testimonies of the outer or external sense perceptions. It is part then of the overcoming of the sphere of sense. Perhaps in another way uh, perhaps not uh, in the same symbolism, but involving the use of the eye, but in a contrary manner, we have the story in the Bible of the eye is single, and the body is filled with light, attempting to describe the necessity for overcoming the polarity of sight. In other words, the concept of good and bad. The Greeks, however, represented this by a cathartic discipline, by means of which they purged the body of its dependence upon the testimony of the senses represented by the eyes. This thought leads us again, of course, to another very interesting problem. Uh, we are told that the essential daemon in the hero or the higher estate as man proceeds is restored to unity and man has an overlife, an internal life which is above sense and which he must call upon uh, when he has certain extreme need. Therefore, the oversoul, or the psychic overself, undoubtedly does have an order or allotment belonging to Minerva, uh, to Minerva, the symbol of the total or complete power of the apperceptive intuitional faculties of man. Uh, the next point that we want to, to bring out particularly is to enlarge upon this problem of the relation of sensory perception uh, to the project in hand. This we have to do something more elaborate with to make it clear. Uh, we are in again the same symbolical situation exactly as we have in Buddhism. In Buddhism we have the problem of illusion and reality. The, uh, the cyclopean eye that is put out is the eye of illusion which is darkened. The individual, therefore, rescuing consciousness from objectivity and illusional attachments. But we learn from the general story that Ulysses is still torn by the sensory perceptions, and that under certain temptations, when all else fails, he binds himself to the central mast of his ship in order that he cannot be lured away or cannot fail. This is the same mast of the ship of Dionysus, around which the grapevine grew uh, in the older legends of the Dionysiac rites. This represents stability, central polarization, uh, the establishment of the life in moderation and in security, what would be equivalent in the Eastern, Eastern system to seating oneself in meditation and remaining in the center uh, to prevent uh, the scattering of the forces and resources of consciousness. In other words, drawing all available power to a center and becoming immovable. And this mast of the ship, of course, represents the pole of the world 
and represents the axis of consciousness itself. So um, Ulysses binds himself to this ship. Now the ship itself, of course, has many interesting meanings. It is the ship of the doctrine of Buddhism, and it is the ancient ship of, of Christianity, uh, the little vessel which is still shown upon the papal ring, the ring of Peter. This ship is, of course, not only the doctrine, but in the old system, it represented the mysteries, the institutions, the sacred doctrine itself, by which all souls are carried home. It is therefore, of course, the security of the revealed rights of the ancient institutions by means of which the preservation and security of man is guaranteed. And binding himself to the doctrine, binding himself absolutely to the laws of the teaching and philosophy in which he was living, he, aga he gains uh, the strength to withstand the various temptations and allurements. Now at one time in his wanderings, Ulysses comes to the land of the Lotus Eaters. And there he has one of his most interesting experiences. This land of the Lotus Eaters is a place uh, where there is almost complete forgetfulness and the individuals live forever in a state of continuous pleasure. Of course, the land of the Lotus Eaters represents the illusion of the continuance of happiness in a state of ignorance. It represents the tendency of men to forget by taking the mysterious nectar of the strange trees that grow in this area and in so doing become oblivious to all the mysteries of life. We have the soul uh, accepting into itself all of the allurements of the senses and becoming drowned or intoxicated by them. In this case we uh, are dealing again with a psychological problem of the individual who attempts to drown the purposes of his psychic life by means of ignoring the better part of his own nature and the principles for which he stands. He have, uh, Ulysses has great difficulty in rescuing his companions from this condition, but he is able himself uh, to escape and to continue his long voyage home. And in the course of this voyage he comes to a m many interesting things. His ship has to pass between a great rock and a whirlpool. And this rock is, of course, and the whirlpool represents desire and anger. Uh, the desire meaning attachments to the past, attachments to a state uh, inferior to himself, or unreasonable ambitions concerning his own future condition. And these desires are also balanced by anger. And in the achievement of psychic polarity, the individual must guide the ship of his soul between the extremes of desire and anger, or the extremes of mortal love and hate. Without overcoming these extremes, he is unable to preserve his course. So each of the journeying adventures of Ulysses have to do with the gradual regeneration of his powers and his motion little by little away from darkness and ignorance and toward the achievement of his heroic destiny, the destiny for which he had dedicated himself. The most dramatic and pictorial and probably the outstanding episode in the entire story is the adventure of Ulysses with Circe the Enchantress. Circe the Enchantress is a delightful problem and it's right in line with our most immediate problems and the destiny of man today because now sense or the sense powers have come head on into imagination represented by the sorceress and imagination is not of course a being outside of man but an excess within himself imagination is man's instinctive tendency when working with the early structure of the psychic life to exchange excess as an escape mechanism physically with imagination as an escape mechanism emotionally or psychically. By imagination, of course, Circe is able to transform all of the attendants of Ulysses into beasts. And Ulysses himself has a very difficult and terrible time to escape from the snares which uh, Circe builds. 
And the Neopaganists point out this very important thing, that until the soul is stabilized, imagination cannot be directed or controlled. And therefore, that imagination uncontrolled is responsible for the larger part of errors which exist in man's world of affairs. Imagination causes the individual to deceive himself. In the level of sense, he is deceived by others, perhaps. On the level of imagination, he deceives himself. For he takes a world and transforms it according to the hazy and uncertain impulses of his own desires. Imagination enables him to see anything the way he wants it to be, regardless of whether it is that way or not. Imagination causes him to fill his world with false doctrines and beliefs, to pursue will of the wisps, to mistake passing pleasures for immortal verities, and mistake always the pleasant for the truthful. It permits him to wander about in long, circuitous passages, uh, without being able to rescue himself. And once he is captured in the snare of imagination, it is very difficult for him to restore his philosophical equilibrium. Uh, the French transcendentalist Eliphas Levy, in one of his works, refers to this sphere of imagination as the astral light. And he says it is a beautiful garden around the stem of each flower, a deadly serpent twined. This is the magic garden of Klingsor in Parsifal. This is the mysterious world of things that are not so, and those worlds in which nothing is good or bad, but thinking and feeling make it so. This is the world in which gave us the Inquisition. It is the world that gives us tyranny, gives us cruelty, gives us heartlessness, gives us hate and fear and terror. This is a world of ignorance, superstition and fear, ruled over by a strange, intangible goddess of excesses. This is Circe, the Enchantress, which is nothing more or less than man's undirected use of the imaginative power of his own soul. This imaginative power is under the ancient guardianship of the lunar principle. Therefore, it ebbs and flows, waxes and wanes like the moon. It passes into eclipse and casts a strange, mysterious light upon the world. It transforms the objective realities of day into the strange, subtle, intangible, often confusing shadows of night. It rules with a strange silver light over all things. Circe the Enchantress is therefore that part of man's own nature which is forever crying for the fulfillment of desire against the demands of character. And uh, in this case, of course, there is a greater illusion added, for man can convince himself that what he wants is good for him. He can also convince himself of many errors about himself. He can be very foolish and convince himself that he is learned. He can be, be very selfish and convince himself that he is kind. He can be filled with hate and convince himself that it is love. All of these illusions arise from his inability uh, to estimate the basic values of his own existence. Now also, in the fable, Circe takes on the appearance and similitude of another character. This uh, particular circumstance causes the illusion or the delusion of Circe or of, of Ulysses toward Circe who feels at some times that she takes on the appearance of his true wife, Penelope. <clears throat> Thus imagination comes to him in the form of truth and takes on the likenesses of realities. Later when we study Penelope a little, I think we'll be able to see why Circe takes this form. But we are dealing definitely with a whole world of pseudo-psychic phenomena of pseudo-psychological phenomena, the basis of nearly all neuroses, frustrations, and phobias. For all these things arise from some kind of ignorance, and mostly they arise from man's unwillingness to face facts naturally and reasonably, 
and his inevitable instinct to clothe them, dramatize them, color them with false values from his own emotional life. Thus, Circe can change human beings into beasts, causing them finally to be completely absorbed in selfishness and in uh, false activities of one kind or another. And, of course, not only uh, do these other companions of Ulysses represent other wayfarers seeking home, they can also be interpreted as the various separate faculties and powers of his own mind and nature. So that, of course, the fact that he cannot save them, and that they must all perish along the way, indicates also that the various attributes and aspects of his own mind cannot survive truth. And that only the one, the master faculty of all, can reach the destination. All others must pass or die along the way, being a race of opinions, attitudes, convictions, of uh, concepts, which have not their foundation in the heroic destiny. Therefore, they cannot survive. We can go considerably further with the problem of Circe, but I think it gives us some uh, general pattern with which we are to uh, work at the time being. Now, let us also bear in mind, as we said, that Neptune, uh, who is the guardian of the seas and to whose aquatic allotment Ulysses belongs, is himself a strange and mysterious power governing the middle diffusions of the objective universe. Neptune is peculiarly patron over the psychic life of man. Therefore, if his spirit belongs to Jupiter, his soul belongs to Neptune, and his body belongs to Pluto or Hades. Each of these has his own laws. And it is the duty of each of these gods, according to the gravitational power of his nymphs, or the spirits that pull for him in one way or another, to hold life to these levels over which these deities have dominion. Therefore, Neptune, representing the psychic field, does not wish uh, Ulysses to escape. And in the long journey, which is through this fluidic element, the psychic life. When it seems that Ulysses is about to escape, Neptune brings the great tempest to bear upon him, giving him all uh, terrible evils and injuries, and causing him, uh, as the commentaries say, the gravest doubts and misgivings. Of course, this is exactly the psychic field, doubts and misgivings. Under the great stress of temptation, of trial, of hardship, of frustration, the individual becomes doubtful. His certainties are weakened. He is no longer sure of his own course. He is afraid. He does not know as yet that there is a true land or a true home which he is going to be able to attain. Thus along the great journey of life, the individual is beset with hardships and the storm of life threatens to close over him, and the psychic stress threatens to engulf him. And in this emergency, which is the greatest that he must bear, Minerva appears, giving him the guidance of heavenly wisdom, giving him the internal experience of security, bestowing upon him the vision or the internal participation in reality. Neptune and Minerva therefore brings with her, so to say, the mystical experience, the sign, the proof, the evidence that the powers of darkness shall not prevail. And thus strengthened, Ulysses is able to escape the wrath of Neptune and to continue on his journey home. Now, of course, the great sea trip is of the journey home. It is the journey across the middle distance between matter and spirit. Now, if you remember in your concepts of ancient philosophy, and we've discussed them so many times, I think you can reconstruct the picture, uh, that the three worlds, heaven, earth, and hell, spirit, soul, and body, were represented by the ancients as three elements, fire, water, and earth. Therefore, the physical world was earth. The psychic world was water, and the spiritual world was fire. And these were the forms of almost 
concentric orbits, with the Earth represented in the center, surrounded by the zone of water, and that surrounded in turn by a zone of clouds and fire. These, this threefold division of the world, represented by fire, the causal sphere, the source of life, by matter, the world of effects or bodies, and by water, the intermediate distance. Plato says that souls descended from the Milky Way and fell into humidity and finally into the bodily form of the earth. The earth itself floated in water, and we have the theories of Anaxagoras and Anaximenes concerning these elements and the old doctrine of Thales, who said that the earth itself was like a ship floating in water and earthquakes were caused by someone rocking the boat. This uh, concept, however, was not water as we know it, but the humidic uh, field of energy that modern science calls ether, but which also represents the magnetic field of the earth, or the psychic envelope of both man and the world in which he lives. Now, the Greeks understood this as a, as a river. <coughs> or as a great zone of water. And they said, therefore, that the world of the living was divided from the world of the dead, or the world of forms from the world of spirit, by a river. And we remember, of course, the river Styx, across which the blind boatman Charon uh, rode the hosts of souls. We remember uh, the river Jordan, and that dear old hymn, just one more river to cross. And that one more river to cross was the ocean which Ulysses was trying to, to cross to get home. And of course the same good old thoughts in the hymns tell us that we shall gather on the further shore, that we shall all be together after we cross the river. We recognize also the mysterious sea which surrounded uh, the Midgard of the ancient Nordics, and in this great ocean slept the great serpent, the Midgard snake, and storms were caused by the motions of this snake at the bed of the great sea. We also have many, many accounts. Remember the great heroes of antiquity, the seamen. Remember that all the instructors of mankind are said to have come out of the sea. Remember that man, as it believed himself, came out of water as a material creature, crawling out of the sea in some prehistoric age and still with certain rudimentary uh, organs remaining within his body to indicate that once he was a creature of the sea. So life crawling out of sea was formed crawling out of the psychic field which enveloped the earth. But the sea also mostly became the symbol of the interval between the land of Elos where the Trojan War was fought, and what Homer calls the, our own far distant native land, which is upon the other shore, upon the far side of the great sea. We remember in the uh, Buddhist system, of course, the ship of the doctrine, which carries souls across from this world to the other land, the better land beyond, uh, where the blessed land doctrine uh, means security. And we see on this ship of the doctrine all types of human beings engaged in various activities while being taken across the sea of soul into the land beyond, the pure land of the, the northern Buddhist teaching. One man in the ship, of course, is standing on the back deck fishing. The journey of souls is not always done consciously, but this great sea of energy, which is the mother of mysteries and the source of life, also is strangely enough this uh, strange sea of psychic phenomena which man must cross in order to reach security from the pressures and intensities of his own nature. So we must cross this great sea, the great water, and in doing this establish freedom and discernment uh, from uh, the illusions of this sea. For it is this psychic sea that feeds generations, and once souls have fallen asleep in the waters of humidity, uh, they float downward until finally, like seeds in the earth, uh, they germinate and are born materially, and are locked within the world of form. The gate of this sea was the constellation of Krator, the cup, and it was here, of course, that the cup of forgetfulness was taken from one of the constellations of the heavens. 
the deluge myths, and all these things have to do with this psychic sea and this tremendous zone of psychic power which man must cross to escape from illusion, which is the sea, and reach reality which lies beyond. So the long journey of Ulysses has to do with the crossing of this sea. The little ship in which he sails is, of course, his own nature, his own psychic integration. The ship which is called the ship of the doctrine or the ship of faith or the power of the essential will of his own nature. Now, in one of his adventures, Ulysses would have been lost had he not been able to grasp a ragged fig tree that grew alone on the edge of a cliff. And the ancient uh, legends tell us that the fig tree was the symbol of the human will, which was called upon in emergency also, and gave the individual the strength to survive the damages and dangers of this hazardous journey that he must take. Now let us pause for a moment and consider the conditions in Ithaca toward which uh, Ulysses was returning. And we have a very interesting and remarkable picture of his faithful wife waiting for him at the end of the journey. Here we find Penelope, who has a very difficult problem on her hands. It is believed that her husband is dead because no word has been ahead of him for a great length of time. And a number of ambitious suitors of one kind or another are making uh, bids for her hand and favor. Uh, they all profess great affection for Penelope, but actually they are all seeking only the authority and power which this little kingdom will bestow if they can marry, marry the widowed queen. Now Penelope is apt in subterfuges herself and is nearly equal to the occasion, for she has decided that she will weave a tapestry and that she will give no answer to these suitors until the tapestry is finished. So whatever she weaves each day, she takes out again at night, so that the tapestry is never done. Now this is a very nice symbol, especially when Porphyry tells us in simple words that Penelope is wisdom. Wisdom, of course, is the mysterious thing, the mysterious person, the mysterious being to whom Ulysses is striving desperately to return. All of his adventures and all of his difficulties are due to the fact that he cannot find his way home. He is in an enchanted world, the world of his own psyche. And to rescue himself from that and finally penetrate on to his own land has taken a great and terrible time. And along that way he has had some pleasures and many misfortunes and even found a friendly king, knowledge who helped him to outfit a ship. He had all kinds of experiences, but what he is trying to do is to get back to wisdom, which is the thing uh, that has always been most necessary. Now, wisdom represented by Penelope is not worldly wisdom as we know it, but what the Neoplatonists termed essential wisdom. It is the wisdom of theurgy itself. It is the wisdom of the great power which the attainment of which is the perfection of the heroic state. When Ulysses can get back to Penelope, he has completed his journey. He, is then, uh, he has then fulfilled what was called his Neptunian allotment. He has still completed his journey in the middle level of heroes, those who must first save themselves. And so to achieve this, he must return and find Penelope. Now, Penelope, as wisdom, is having a difficult time with a number of ambitious persons who wish to marry her. Not for her own sake, but for the power she will bestow. And even back in those uh, early times when life was far less complicated than it is now, the Greeks declared that the mysterious, selfish, hateful, unpleasant, and ambitious suitors of Penelope represented worldly knowledge, all of them trying to be married to wisdom. Or more correctly, all of the materialistic arts, sciences, philosophies, and religions. Everything that for its own good, for its own advancement, was seeking for skill, knowledge, and power. 
Therefore, Penelope, as wisdom, was being courted by all who claimed or desired to possess her. These among themselves argued, fought, and debated as to who was going to have her, none of them knowing she would have none of them. And in order to make the situation safe for herself, Penelope, whose weaving of the tapestry of life was to represent the full story of knowledge, or the full story of true inner knowledge, always removed at night what she had woven in the daytime, so that she never finished the search or the process of completing this work. And she said she would not marry until it was finished. In other words, she would not accept any of these suitors until her own work was done. And she made certain that the work could never be done. And so, in the search for essential knowledge, in man's experience, no matter how much he knows, something at night, something mysterious, takes out that learning and must weave it again the next day. So that no matter how much we know, we never know all. No matter how much we woo wisdom, we cannot attain its completeness, and therefore we cannot fulfill the requirements. And in order to protect wisdom's works, which are the key to its own nature, wisdom forever conceals or unravels what it has done. Thus it is that wisdom hides or protects its own works, so that selfish men can never possess either these works or wisdom itself. And, of course, in those days, there were among the Greeks what were called sophists. The original sophists were very great and admirable persons, including some of the great immortals of early Grecian life, like Thales and Solon and Patakas and Periander. But the later sophists were professional teachers who gained no reputation except for selfishness because they commercialized learning. And they were associated with false knowledge, Man learning for gain rather than for good. And the false suitors in the time of uh, the Greek culture therefore represented all the ulterior motives of man by which men seek to be wise and for purposes of injuring each other, of, for taking hold of knowledge as power and using it against the common good, skill to kill rather than to create and to enlighten. Thus, essential wisdom kept her house and in a strange and wonderful way under the protection of her own proper guiding allotment Minerva, she was able uh, to confound the suitors until such time as Ulysses could return because Ulysses if he returns is going to be worthy of her he is, the, he, uh, he is her true husband and here the Neoplatonists point out a very very interesting point Namely, uh, that Ulysses is not returning to Mary. He is returning to the wife he had before he left on the journey. And that is one of the uh, points which is particularly uh, important. In other words, Ulysses is not obtaining new wisdom, but he is restoring his own inner knowledge of that wisdom which has always been his. He is returning again to his own proper abode where wisdom waits for him as it has always waited. Now when the time comes for Ulysses to at last appear, he comes not in his own proper person, but as an ancient beggar. This is again, of course, part of the idea. He returns as the mendicant. He returns as the one who has renounced all worldly goods. He returns as a common person coming secretly back to his own house. And the only one who immediately knows of his coming is his son, who is able to recognize him. And in Telemachus we have a symbol which the Greeks also greatly emphasized, namely that the son, which represents the works or the achievements of the father, recognize their own cause or their own source, but no one else does. And then he is given the bow and arrow, which has been held and stored for him since he departed. The bow and arrow which no one but himself can use. 
and with these shafts and arrows he slays all the suitors, destroys them. And the Greeks say that in so doing he achieves actually the final overthrow of all the dissonant elements of his own soul, that he overcomes all the errors and illusions uh, which are within himself, and he also penetrates and scatters all false concepts concerning wisdom. He destroys the false suitors of wisdom. But there is another interesting uh, peculiarity of this fable that much of which much is made, namely that when Ulysses returns home, and even after he has slain the suitors and regained his original appearance and estate, Penelope does not recognize him immediately. As the poem says, she hopes, she thinks, she wonders, one moment she believes, and then she does not believe. She is not sure that it is Ulysses. Now the answer to that in the Neoplatonic doctrine is that essential wisdom, which resides within the higher psychic life of man, has been so separated from the lower personality that when man, through experience and trial, returns to wisdom, wisdom does not at first even recognize the being who went away. That it has so completely changed and altered all its nature and appearance that for a time, wisdom is not sure of her own psychic nature. She is not sure of the returning hero who represents the redeemed and regenerated powers of the personality. The personality, in other words, returns home as a stranger. It returns home as one not easily recognized. And it is only after a time that this recognition by wisdom is accorded. Now, if we study the Neoplatonic concept of wisdom, we shall also understand a little more of why this is true. Wisdom representing the anthropos, or the higher parts of the older soul, with their intuitive powers. This does not and did not descend into matter with the extension of its own objective psychic nature. Therefore, the psychic totality of man is not necessarily informed as to the appearance and nature of the personality dependent from it. Therefore, when the objective being returns to psychic totality, it may not immediately or evidently be known. It is not that which departed. It is a different and a completely changed being with which wisdom has no immediate association or contact but to which wisdom is finally restored and united in a full and complete understanding. Part of this uh, allegory also occurs in Lawrence's work of the 18th century, The Adventures of Common Sense, where wisdom plays an important personified role in that work also. Now also in the uh, Odyssey there is another intimation that when Ulysses returns to his own homeland, his own psychic nature, he also then seeks the shrine and mystery of his ancient father. He goes further, but there's not too much about this, but there is just an intimation that he is seeking for his father, and he goes alone to seek his father. And this aged king, the ancient king whom he seeks, is itself a very wonderful symbol. It is distinctly stated that, uh, that Ulysses goes alone to visit this lonely king. Here we have the uh, definition given by Plotinus of what constitutes the mystical journey. The journey of the alone to the alone. And in the closing parts of the Odyssey, we have this almost completely stated in the Homeric version. By this we mean that uh, Ulysses is not only now completing the heroic cycle of Neptune, but is now about to be to join with the cycle of his old and venerable father, who is above, who, uh, who rests in a superior state. In other words, he is then ready to progress into what is called the allotment of Jupiter. He will then his next uh, allotment will then be that having redeemed or perfected his own nature, he will then pass into the highest order of heroes, 
those who live not to save themselves but to save others. And when he uh, returns and searches for his father, he bids in that way for the next step or the next allotment from the gods in the heroic order. It means that at that time he has perfected or completed his own uh, life cycle. Now there is also no doubt in the world uh, that the story can be regarded and perhaps was at some time regarded as a religious or ceremonial pageant and that it may well have been performed as part of the state mysteries of Greece during the period of the rise of the Orphic Dionysiac tradition. Under these conditions, of course, Ulysses becomes the eternal candidate seeking initiation into the mysteries. Ulysses passes through twelve distinct adventures which correspond to the twelve labors of Hercules. And uh, also these represent the passage of the sun through the twelve signs of the zodiac. Thus we have an astronomical mythos which is repeated also in the Arabic fable of the story of Sindad the Sailor. The adventures of Sindad are undoubtedly based upon uh, Arabic uh, impressions of the Odyssey. The story, of course, is also rather strongly set forth in the parable of the prodigal son. It is checked and rechecked in the story of the book of Job. All of these legends recur among different peoples. In the story of the prodigal son, the son goes down to the flesh pots of Egypt and wastes his substance in riotous living, and then he returns home. And when he returns home, for him the fatted calf is offered up, because the dead is alive, the lost is found. And this return to the father's house, which is also contained in the Gnostic hymn of the robe of glory, all represents the journey home on one or other level of mankind. The, the Ulysses story is called heroic because it is archetypal. In other words, it, uh, the difference now becomes philosophical on another level. The personal story of any person's journey home, to the degree that it is personal and human, which your scriptural writings and your great epical works are archetypal. They are not the story of a person. They are the story of emotion involving all persons. They are the story of a state which must be attained by all human beings. Therefore, they are archetypal. They represent a path that all must follow, or many at least must follow. They are no longer, therefore, the stories of individuals, but the stories of prototypic beings. Therefore, they are called heroic. They are heroic because the key to them is the key to the regeneration of whole orders of life. In this case, the key to the regeneration of humanity. You will observe also that in these rituals, whether it be in the story of Ulysses or any other, we do not have any embodiment of the power of evil. We have always the journey home representing the conquest of the psychic polarities of the self. All of the agencies involved, even including Minerva, Neptune, and Pluto, are all within the individual. They are all levels of being within his own consciousness, which makes the entire subject very highly psychological and teaches very distinctly that man's conquest of self is the supreme achievement in the light of nature. The Odyssey covers many things. One other which we would like to mention because of its uh, great interest, and that is the story of the descent of Ulysses into Hades. This is part of one of his adventures. And he goes down into the underworld, and there he perceives certain terrible and uh, sad spectacles. He perceives there the results of the psychic pressure. The underworld, as described by Ulysses, becomes therefore the proper symbol of a sphere of extreme neurotic uh, conflict a sphere of complexes, frustrations, and neuroses. All the beings in these underworlds are repeated, repeating blindly and continuously some symbolic action 
associated with the difficulties or the conditions which caused them finally to come to this sphere of darkness. Thus the world, this underworld, represents the zone of man's subconscious or unconscious life. And Ulysses descending into it finds these symbolic excesses. One, the man who is rolling the boulder up the hill, and every time it reaches the top, it escapes from him and rolls down again. And he must go back up and down forever, unable to escape this strange load to which he is attached. This entire process of rolling the boulder is nothing but a very thin, veiled statement of ambition. It carries the individual's tremendous dedication to some unworthy and unnatural purpose, which having no content in reality, can never succeed. The individual who rises merely falls, and who falls merely falls to rise again. And on in a great cycle, a cycle of pressures, the individual becomes the absolute psychic slave of his own impulses. Thus the underworld is locked within the human being as the source of habits of these things that we do again and again and forever without real reason or without real purpose. And Ulysses is taken down into this world in order that he may see uh, the psychic consequences of these addictions to inadequate concepts of existence. Each one of his adventures carries the same message on some level of sensory perception. Gradually, however, he clears this sensory perception. For when the time comes, he recognizes Penelope, although she does not recognize him. He knows at all times the purpose of his journey, but he is not always sure that he will survive. Here again, we can have elements from the rituals of initiation, the temptations by which the soul is tried, as are set forth in the Egyptian ritual of the dead. Thus, we have several possible levels for the interpretation of the Ulysses story. But I think that we are reasonably certain that the general struggle is between Ulysses and the concept of egoism within himself. And the various elements of this conflict are embodied and personified in his adventures and hardships. In the end, however, he is given to be returned to his lawful life wisdom, and will be given power to rule ever after in happiness over the kingdom of nature, which is his proper allotment. We also know that this is the distant city toward which he is always seeking to go, and whose shoreline he does not even recognize when he sees it. This is the city of good intention. This is utopia. This is the New Jerusalem, the heavenly city the city of rest and peace. This is the mysterious nirvanic city of the East, uh, the abode of everlasting trans tranquility. This is Sukhavati's golden shores. And he is seeking to reach it because it is the city of peace. It is the city of tranquility and of joy. But it is a city, as a state of consciousness, which has been infected by these suitors who must be removed. The uh, temple must be cleansed. And Ulysses, in destroying the suitors, fulfills the same symbolical act as Jesus casting the moneylenders from the porch of the temple. All these are the restoration of sanctity, the restoration of sacredness. And uh, with uh, Ulysses' poem, Penelope then finishes her painting, or her tapestry. And in this tapestry, she reveals all of the operations of natural law. Therefore, to the one who is enlightened and redeemed, wisdom gives all of her secrets. But until they are enlightened and redeemed, nature conceals part of her secrets and even destroys some of her work by night so that men will not be able to fathom her mysteries. And those who are selfish and profane can never become possessors of the great wisdom or the greater doctrines which are the secrets of nature's uh, wondrous powers and workings. And so in the story, we have a rather contemporary trend. We have a trend that teaches us that each individual's personal journey of self-control is an odyssey, and that he too is seeking his homeland, and that he finds his homeland after strange adventures. They are no longer perhaps so picturesque as those described in the odyssey, 
and there are not many cyclops wandering around today. But within our own living, we pass through all these tragedies. And when we pass through them, they are as great as though they involve all the cosmos. And the giants of selfishness that we must slay are not less in stature than the giants of ancient times. It is, however, a qualitative victory, one in which the strength of self over circumstance, as Plotinus calls it, is the key to man's internal peace and security and his ultimate re-identification by theurgy with the eternal wisdom of the Father. These are the principal elements of the story, and by aid of these keys, I think you could read the entire work with a fair degree of comprehension. And that in so doing, you would then be thinking as the Neoplatonists thought, thinking with Plato and the others, that this fable is a thinly veiled account of each man's journey to that land which is his true home. And in that thinking, then, I think we probably have done about enough this evening. Thank you.